Very good morning, it's Penny Wild, the Black Pen. I'm a bit nervous today because we've got so much to get through and I don't know how long this video is going to be. I know a lot of people have complained about my really long videos and I apologize, but I have to go through all of the stuff that I'm going through today uh, because I think it's fundamentally important. You know, I think there's going to be follow up videos to this and it's fine, but I need to get through this today. But before I start, back in 2010, I released my first hip hop mixtape. I've got two hip hop mixtapes for anyone that's interested. And one of the songs I, I made, okay, 2010 was my first one. In 2016, 17, I made a song called Amakupta. Come on. A song called Amakupta. I think it's a good way to start this morning. 2017, boy. Pen you well the black pen. I think I'm gonna put a link to my SoundCloud for this track. Cause it's bumping. The black pen, 100 million. Speta makuta. Speta ma speta ma speta makuta. Ulele usele with mali so kanda le mali so tola so suta. Speta makuta. Speta ma speta ma speta makuta. Ulele usele with mali so kanda le mali so tola so suta. Speta makuta. Speta ma speta ma speta makuta. Speta makuta. Speta makuta. Sizi mo bluta. Speta makuta. Peter must Peter must Peter Macuta. Ulele Usele with Spali so Kanda de Mali so Kala so Suta. Bless her, bless her, bless her. Dubai in the Chief Abbey so Setter. Mafuso so Fella is delay, he push out Febo non Dubai's letter. Hosel is eating and he's getting eaten and eating like Hannibal Letter. Ha ha, Hannibal Letter. Shut up, Sup is not a lecture. Tina si bis got the money game. Si funa un noto and fuck the fame. I say all the same. Pay you well and same. Forbes billionaire through all the pain. Coming from me, papa na mas. Si zono on and jenye big nazi. Get up a fazi. Mami uyazi. Wallet bigger than tech and lack of stars. Jemma Oscar Joy, yell out my sipper. From the old so like I'm a heater. How buildings in Mandela City? Jewish money so kept me young niswa. Fuck your life, cause I'ma gon' shine. Pushing pork so toss up a swine. Pussy wine, rich niggas be down. On the states of money tenders, alright? Wrecking pips like forex endeavors. Meta trading on all of you heifers. Do do's on their cool boost on speed down. Open rich by a or oh clever. More game than Ronaldo and Messi. More game than Cyril, that's messy. Easy nyati step deep in my pocket. We cock it while our money blasting off like rackets. Come on, spit on my gupta. 2017, pen you well, the black pen. Okay, let's get to it, because like I said, we have a lot to get through. Dailymaverick.co.za Yeah. Rajesh and Atul Gupta arrested in Dubai. But don't expect them in South Africa too soon. I'm going to try and pace myself, because like I said, we have a lot to get through. This was written by Rebecca Davis on the 6th of June, 2022. Rajesh and Atul Gupta, key figures in South Africa's state capture project, have been arrested in Dubai. The news will be widely celebrated following years of unsuccessful attempts to apprehend the fugitives of justice. But there are indications that there could be a long road ahead before the brothers are seen again in South Africa. When News24 broke the news on Monday night, that was last night, that Rajesh and Atul Gupta had been arrested in Dubai, Citing anonymous sources, some fear the report was too good to be true. I've got so many questions. You know, one of the things about today's discussions is there's a lot of answers, but I've got so many other questions, and I'm hoping that as the days unfold, we will get some of these answers to these questions. News24 broke news citing anonymous sources of something, of something so sensitive that it involves Interpol. And yet they had that type of intel is quite scary, to be honest. Initially, local authorities seemed hesitant to confirm the development, with Department of Justice spokesperson Crispin Peary telling News24 there is no confirmation. But an hour later, an official statement from the Department of Justice confirmed the report, albeit with a noticeable absence of additional detail. The Ministry of Justice and Correctional Services confirms that it has received information from law enforcement authorities in the United Arab Emirates, the UAE, that fugitives of justice, namely Rajesh and Atul Gupta, have been arrested, the statement read. Discussions between various law, agency, law enforcement agencies in the UAE and South Africa on the way forward are ongoing, 
the South African government will continue to cooperate with the UAE. Two things are revealing about the statement. The first is its terseness, with those three sentences constituting the totality of the announcement. The second is the apparent lack of the sense of jubilation that might be expected from local law enforcement authorities, given that the attempt to have the Guptas apprehended has dragged on for so long with so little success up to now. It was only in 2022 that South African authorities succeeded in having the Guptas placed on Interpol's red notice list. And even then, eyebrows were raised at the fact that the Guptas did not appear on the published list of fugitives on Interpol's website. It is not clear why remaining Gupta brother AJ appears to have escaped arrest at this time. Before I carry on reading, it was only in 2022 that South African authorities succeeded in having the Guptas placed on Interpol's red notice list. What is Interpol's red notice list? And before we even go to the red notice list, who the hell is Interpol? The International Criminal Police Organization, known as Interpol, is an international organization that facilitates worldwide police cooperation and crime control. Headquartered in Lyon, Lyon, France, it is the world's largest international police organization with seven regional bureaus worldwide and a national central bureau in all 195 member states. Interpol was conceived during the first International Crime Police Congress in 1914, which brought officials from 24 countries to discuss cooperation in law enforcement. It was founded in, 19, in September 1923 as the International Criminal Police Commission, the ICPC, adopting many of its current duties throughout the 1930s. After coming under Nazi control in 1938, the agency was effectively moribund until the end of World War II. So at some point, Interpol was owned by Nazi Germany. In 1965, the ICPC adopted a new constitution and the name Interpol derived from its telegraphic address used since 1946. Interpol provides investigative support, expertise and training to law enforcement worldwide, focusing on three major areas of transnational crime, terrorism, cybercrime and organized crime. Its broad mandate covers virtually every kind of crime, including crimes against humanity, child pornography, drug trafficking and production, political corruption, international property infringement and white collar crime. The agency also facilitates cooperation among national law enforcement institutions through criminal databases and communications networks. Contrary to popular belief, Interpol itself is not a law enforcement agency. It has an annual bu budget of 142 million euros, most of which comes from annual contributions by member police forces in 181 countries. It is governed by a general assembly composed of all member countries, which elects the executive committee and the president, who is currently Ahmed Nasser al-Raisi of the United Arab Emirates, to supervise and implement Interpol's policies and administration. Day-to-day -day operations are carried out by the General Secretariat, comprising around 1,000 personnel from over 100 countries, including police and civilians. The Secretariat is led by the Secretary General, currently Jürgen Stock, the, de the former Deputy Head of Germany's Federal Criminal Police Office. I want to emphasize, contrary to popular belief, Interpol is itself not a law enforcement agency. Now we know who Interpol are. What the hell is an Interpol Red Notice? This is from Interpol International, which is a website. A Red Notice is a request to law enforcement worldwide to locate and provisionally arrest a person pending extradition, surrender or similar legal action. Extradition is the removal of a person from a requested state to a requesting state for the criminal prosecution or punishment. Put differently to extradite is to surrender or obtain surrender of a fugitive from one jurisdiction to another. This is essentially what South Africa wants of Dubai in the United Arab Emirates to bring the Gupta brothers from Dubai to South Africa uh, in a form of extradition. The Red Notice, Red Notice contains two main types of information. Number one, information to identify the wanted person, such as their name, their date of birth, 
their nationality, their hair and eye color, photographs and fingerprints if available. Number two, information related to the crime they are wanted for, which can be typically a murder, a rape, child abuse or armed robbery. Red notices are published by Interpol at the request of a member country and must comply with Interpol's constitution and rules. A red notice is not an international arrest warrant. I want to emphasize that again. A red notice is not an international arrest warrant. There are currently approximately 69,270 valid red notices, of which some 7,500 are public. The rest are actually private. The majority of red notices are restricted to law enforcement use only. Very, very important. You can go onto the website and you can read more on red notices. Going back to our article. It was only in 2022, this is dailymaverick.co.za, that South African authorities succeeded in having the Guptas placed on Interpol's red notice list. And even then, eyebrows were raised at the fact that the Guptas did not appear on the published list of fugitives on Interpol's website. As we heard, some of these are public, a very few 7,500 and close to 70,000 in total, of which I guess the Guptas were part of that private list. It is not clear why the remaining Gupta brother, AJ, appears to have escaped arrest at this time. Daily Maverick understands from senior security forces, sources rather, however, that full-blown celebration at the thought of the Gupta's imminent appearance in a South African courtroom is almost certainly premature. While the news of the arrests should be welcomed as a significant and overdue development, there are no guarantees that the Gupta's extradition, as we explain what extradition is, bringing them from the jurisdiction in Dubai in the UAE to South Africa. There are no guarantees that the Gupta's extradition from the UAE to South Africa will now proceed swiftly and smoothly. As Jessica Persedenot has previously observed in Daily Maverick, the Guptas can be relied on to litigate their guts out. That means use the courts and the law in Dubai courts to prevent their extradition. Attempts to seek comment from the Guptas legal team on Monday night were unsuccessful, but Business Day reported shortly after the news broke that the first move from the brothers will be to seek bail later this week. Daily Maverick also understands that there's some frustration among the security cluster at the manner in which the news of the arrests were broken, as it was felt it would, be, it would be preferable for the announcement to come from the UAE or Interpol side. Where did News24 get their anonymous sources from? Such a sensitive matter of in international criminal proportions. However, News24 had access to this type of information, which means someone leaked this information to News24. Who are those people? How safe is this type of intel? This is due to the very de delicate diplomatic egg dance that is ongoing between South Africa and the UAE over the extradition issue with a strong awareness that the trigger cannot be pulled until all elements are in place. Daily Maverick has been informed that South African lawyers are already in the UAE to work on the case. One of the trickiest aspects concerns, uh, aspects concern which charges should be brought against the Guptas, which have to both match the requirements of the UAE law and prove rock solid in the face of the Guptas' legal onslaught against it. There has been no official confirmation of the charges against the Guptas at this point, although News24 has reported that they will be charged in connection with the uh, Nulane or Nulane investment fraud and money laundering case set down for the Bloemfontein High Court in September. Poseidon note warned in May the Guptas can't be brought home on lesser charges in the hope that the final case against them can be fine-tuned once they landed at Tambo International. This extradition application simply has to be the definitive case against the Guptas. One that says, here it is, state captures ultimate seminal case. In terms of building a bulletproof case against the Gupta brothers, the findings of the Commission of Inquiry into State Capture, what we know as the Zondo Commission, have thus far offered surprisingly little meat. For those of you who do not know, not a lot was found at the, Zuma com at the Zondo Commission, even though over a billion rand was spent. Jacob Zuma himself has not been implicated in the State Capture Commission as being corrupt or has been captured. There was no definitive report that stated that, otherwise he would have been arrested. Jacob Zuma was actually arrested for contempt of court, meaning that he was summoned to come to court. He refused to come there, even though he cited reasons and applied through his lawyers four reasons for why Judge Raymond Zondo must recuse himself because he had a link to President, uh, ex-President Jacob Zuma. 
Je Raymond Zondo refused. Jacob Zuma and his lawyers refused to appear in court and he was arrested on that. Not because he was found guilty of state capture. And as this uh, Daily Maverick report states, very little meat was given on the Guptas themselves being involved in state capture. What did come out, of course, and we've heard it recently, is Brian Mulife's testimony implicating current President Cyril Ramaphosa working with Glencore, who have been found to have paid hundreds of millions of dollars in bribes around the world. Surprisingly, South Africa was not included in that list. But we know that Glencore has worked with President Cyril Ramaphosa's company, Shanduga, in getting or supplying coal to ESCOM at highly inflated prices. Very important. The only member of the Gupta family recommended for potential prosecution by the NPA in the Zondo Commission reports to date has been Rajesh Tony Gupta, who has been earmarked twice. Firstly, for allegedly offering a bribe to former SAA CEO Vuisi Lekona or Kona, and secondly, for allegedly offering a bribe to former Deputy Finance Minister ABC Jonas, who claims that he was offered, I think, 600 million rand, which he refused. The DAC viewer Garube or Harubi said on Monday night that the party looks forward to more information regarding the arrests and the process that will be followed after these arrests. Harube or Garube added it is of absolute importance that there is transparency on this matter. With news of the Gupta arrests uh, briefly succeeding in pushing President Cyril Ramaphosa's current farm gate woes out of the media spotlight, questions are inevitably being asked and conspiracy theories busily being forged about the timing of what must be a highly welcome distraction for Cyril Ramaphosa. A lot of people are currently saying this is a distraction from Cyril Ramaphosa's accusations with the money that was stolen on his farm. And I will get into that case a bit later. Like I said, I have a lot to get through. Dailymaverick.co.za, like I said, this article was written by Rebecca Davis on the 6th of June, 2022. And I move to a, a piece by Daily Maverick as well which is from the 1st of June, 2017, all the way back then when I was really, when I released Petama Gupta, Petama Gupta, Sizemogluta. The 1st of June by S. Brimmer, S. Sol, and B. Brick, or yo, how do you pronounce this name? B-R-K-I-C, Brick. S. Brimmer, S. Sol, and B. Brick. Dailymaverick.co.za, 1st of June, 2017. Last weekend, the Sunday Times and City Press fired the first salvos in a story that should shake our nation to the core. The format did not exaggerate when it referred to emails that proved the Guptas run South Africa, even if its judgment was based on limited facts, as we shall see by Stefans Brummer, Sam Sol, and Branko Brech. Brech, whatever. The two newspapers had access to a trove of about 650 emails sent between the Gupta brothers, their associates, and others. Today, Scorpio, the Daily Maverick's newly launched investigative uh, unit, and Amapungani, the independent investigative non-profit, start publishing stories from a much, much wider trove, a few hundred gigabytes of information containing between 100,000 and 200,000 unique emails and a host of other documents. This we call the hashtag Gupta Leaks. Why did we not publish this before? Why did we let ourselves be scooped? The answer is in all we shall call a story of heroes and the misguided. The heroes are whistleblowers who may be risking their lives to expose the truth and the others who assisted in the process. For now, for their safety, they shall remain unsung. The misguided are people whom we have trusted and let into the process, but who took a copy and without our knowledge caused a selection to be leaked to the two newspapers last week. Their motive was short-term political gain. They seem to have thought they could influence the ANC National Executive Committee, the NEC, to recall the president, which was Jacob Zuma at the time. They failed. Our approach was different based on journalistic values. We had the information for some time, but held back in the interests of in-depth inquiry and the safety of the whistleblowers. The first consideration was informed by the nature of the information. There was some low-hanging fruit, yes, many examples of which were in the sample that was leaked to the two, two newspapers. But much of the data or data is such that it requires a painstaking, painstaking assembly of pieces of a very large puzzle, combining what is in the Gupta leaks, leaks with external information. The second consideration is Journalism 101. 
One does not publish before taking all reasonable steps to secure sources who may be in harm's way. Full stop. Those who caused the sample to be leaked in the two newspapers appear to have put expediency above the whistleblower's safety. Our plan had been to research thoroughly for months if need be to get a sizable proportion of the really important stories ready before first publication. That way, should there be any attempt to stop us after first publication, we could have put it all out at once. That too is journalism 101. So why do we start publishing now? The horse has bolted. The whistleblower's safety no longer lies in delaying publication, but in us declaring the full extent of what is out there. Shutting up the whistleblowers will not plug the leak because we have, we ha we have all they had. Coming force will not help either. It was our plan eventually to place the full Gupta leaks on a platform accessible to the wider media for further investigation. We have now brought that forward and placed the full Gupta leaks in the care of an offshore organization, which will load it to a secure platform from which it will soon be accessible to many bona fide journalists, including the Sunday Times and City Press. We bear them no grudge as they do not know the context. This information is both too dangerous and too important to share. Too important not to share. Let the people know. This was in 2017. Daily Maverick, 1st of June 2022. The 10 revelations from the Gupta leaks that changed the course of South Africa. Jesus. Jesus. 2017 and now summary. 10 revelations which came from the Gupta leaks of which we read there that there were 100,000 to 200,000 emails. But when they started, they said that there was about 650 emails sent between the Gupta brothers, their associates, and others. Very juicy at the time, as I said earlier, very sad that over a billion rand later, all the lawyers that had made money, who Judge Raymond Zondo, who is now the Chief Justice, uh, surprisingly and conveniently, after the commission, who has now been made Chief Justice by Cyril Ramaphosa, even though he was not the recommended candidate by the JSC at the time, was catapulted to Chief Justice by Cyril Ramaphosa, who had the discretion, even though he was implicated. He was given the report. I think the report was given in three parts to Cyril Ramaphosa. Still, the, the Guptas weren't fundamentally, fundamentally caught out. You guys are guilty. Just two potential allegations to uh, Tony Gupta. The other brothers, unfortunately, were not implicated. Very, very sad. And again, Jacob Zuma was not implicated in that same Zondo commission, even though the media and the propaganda would have you believe. Zuma was guilty. Zuma was guilty. It's clear. It's not clear. Unfortunately, the 10 revelations. Daily Maverick by staff reporter, 1st of June, 2022. On the 1st of June, 2017, so that was five years ago, five year anniversary, Daily Maverick's newly launched investigative unit, which I think was Scorpio per the article, and Amapungani, the independent investigative non-profit, started publishing stories from a trove of emails and a host of other documents, several hundred gigabytes large. We called it the hashtag Gupta Leaks, and it changed the course of South Africa. I think that's a break. It took shamans, not to policy kind of man. Let's go into these supposed revelations. Guptas and Associates scored 5.3 billion rand in locomotives kickbacks. In our first expose from the Gupta leaks, we showed how President Jacob Zuma's friends and their associates were diverting billions of rands of, from Transnet's purchase of locomotives to their offshore accounts. I know I'm a Jacob Zuma fan. I will not and never protect Jacob Zuma if he is guilty of corruption. I will say that Jacob Zuma, ex-President ex -president Thabo Mbegi, ex-President Nelson Mandela, may he rest in peace, the current president, Cyril Ramaphosa, ex-apartheid president, or FW declared on those guys, a lot of these politicians that we love have got a lot of blood on their hands. They've got a lot of corruption and bribery and, and dodgy dealings on their hands. And Jacob Zuma is no exception. There is no proof, of course, only allegations and rumors. Unfortunately, we have a legal system that has to prove beyond reasonable doubt that you are guilty. Hearsay and rumors and someone sort of saying is not good enough, sadly. When the Kandla story came out, I wanted Zuma to be held accountable for the money that he spent. 
The fact that he was not involved in the security upgrades that cost over 240 million rand for me was not good enough. He was president, it was his home. So therefore he needs to be held accountable. And he ended up paying, I think it may have been something silly like 7 million rand of which he managed to raise a loan from what was then VBS, the Vendor uh, Banking Society, the mutual bank, which has now collapsed. All very tricky, dodgy dealings. Marcus Yuster, of course, of Steinhoff himself, who was implicated in yeah, hundreds of millions of rands of money lost with Steinhoff, also was charged, I think, something like 22 million rand. A pittance, a very small amount of the money lost. I will not defend Jacob Zuma if corrupt, if the laws find him corrupt. I love Jacob Zuma for being a great African man, for being a polygamist, of which I think he carried that very well, of being a father of over 20 children, and his children love him. I have personally met some of his children. And for being a maverick. You know, when we speak about Vladimir Putin, Donald Trump, Robert Mugabe, uh, Mao Tse, Tse, uh, Zidong, etc. These are mavericks. Cecil John, people who are constantly sidestepping. We speak about the, Defl the Teflon Dawn of the Mafia bosses in New York. You know, people like John Gotti. You know, um, this guy was attacked by the media relentlessly. He was attacked by opposition parties. He was dragged in parliament. He was accused of so many things. And he seemed to win all these cases and never be found guilty. The arms deal, which has been heavily implicated on, which sadly, for some reason, they didn't include Tabombe, even though he was involved as well. He was never found guilty and it kept being extended. He might pass away one day because he's an old man, never having really, really faced charges. And he'd laugh through these things and he'd sing and he'd dance. I learned to see how a man can handle so much pressure and still be able to love his family, still be loved by the South African masses, I believe, especially the Zulu people because we're a tribalistic nation. A maverick, a unique human being. That's why I loved him because... There are so many lessons to learn from Jacob Zuma, but I'll never defend him. But we have to look at the hypocrisy of the media. And we're happy today that we have the social media, which now we compare a Jacob Zuma and a Cyril, where there are similar, very similar moves. However, Cyril is treated with white gloves. It showed how President Jacob Zuma's friends and their associates were diverting billions of rands from Transnet. Why do we never hear of Cyril Ramaphosa's friends and associates? Friends and associates at Glencore, people like Ivan Klossenberg, friends and associates like Stephen Saad at Aspen, who was given the manufacturing rights for the COVID vaccines. Friends and associates of Cyril Ramaphosa, Bedvest, who probably earned the highest money from tenders in this country. Friends and associates at MTN, friends like Putuman Klego, who are currently babysitting his company Shanduga under Pembani. Friends and associates, family, like his brother Patrice Muntipe, who is enjoying independent power producer status with ESCOM, where Cyril Ramaphosa at some point was in charge of the war room at ESCOM, and yet his brother-in-law is benefiting along with his other brother-in-law, Jeff Khadebe. And there are so many business associates that Cyril Ramaphosa has worked with because he sat on boards. At some point, he sat on 18 boards at one time which was absolutely ridiculous. He's had chairmanships. He worked on the, in the company that, that was working with Glencoe to supply coal at a highly inf inflated price. Why, when the articles are released by the media, why do we not hear President Cyril Ramaphosa's friends, family, and associates being implicated? But with Jacob Zuma, it was always highlighted. This is not Jacob Zuma. He didn't do anything here, but his friends and his associates, what's that got to do with Jacob Zuma? until you can fundamentally prove. And this is why some of us take offense when we look at the hypocrisy. Not to defend Jacob Zuma, even though people like myself love him personally, but for the fact that if we're gonna go after someone, you guys claim that here's the rule of law. Let's follow it, let's respect it. Why are you guys not following and respecting the same rule of law? If you're going to punish people for crimes, why were white apartheid murderers, killers, why were they not jailed after the Truth and Reconciliation Commission? Why do we have APLA soldiers who I think were under, uh, I think they were the military wing, maybe of the PAC or Azapa. Why are some of them still sitting in jail when white killers managed to get away with this? Why was FW declared given a Nobel Peace Prize instead of charged with crimes against humanity? 
And yet, all Robert Mugabe are charged with those things. Where is the rule of law in that so much hypocrisy purely because what it seems there are certain factions, not just in the ANC, but in the economy at large, that if certain people are benefiting from the economy, it's fine. But when other people are um, benefiting from the economy, the media, which is owned by this faction, throws everything in the kitchen sink at these people and blasts them as bad people. And that's the issue that some of us have. And we don't like being taken for clowns, not just with these things, but also with things like COVID reports. We have had these daily reports. How many people have COVID? And we've asked, why not do the same with flu? Why not do the same with pneumonia? In South Africa, tuberculosis, TB is the highest killer to this day. Why are we not seeing tuberculosis stats every day? Why are we not seeing stats of road accident fatalities every day? And now that we've got vaccines and we've seen the reports with Pfizer with over 2,000 side effects, why are we not seeing the same stats of how many people are dying or getting sick from the COVID vaccines every day? The propaganda is one-sided and it's very frustrating for a rational mind that thinks to be like, clearly there is an agenda here. Apologies for diverting. I just wanted to speak on this. Bell Pottinger, spinner of a web for pioneers of economic transformation. The cachet or the cache of leaked Gupta email supported claims made in an anonymous report earlier in 2017 that controversial UK PR firm Bell Pottinger attempted to salvage the reputations of the Gupta and Zuma families by portraying them as victims of a racist backlash by white monopoly capital. It came out that Bell Pottinger, Bell Pottinger are spin doctors. They are people that you pay who use the media, who use social media to create fake accounts and fake stories to make you look like a good person, maybe a victim. That's what it came out. None of us had ever heard of Bell Pottinger. One of the interesting things and tactics that Jacob Zuma has been very good at is whenever he's been accused of stuff, he's always managed to put up a mirror so that the people that are accusing him get exposed for what they've done. When the Guptas were um, um, accused of funny dealings at ESCOM, a mirror was brought up and all of a sudden we heard of things called evergreen contracts. Contracts that had been signed under apartheid which essentially never expire at crazy, crazy ridiculous prices of which Glencore has become one of the beneficiaries of that. And all of a sudden we found out that the Guptas were only supplying a small amount of coal to ESCOM and even the way they supplied or got the deal was above board because it's something that's normally done in business. Similarly here with Bell Pottinger, Jacob Zuma in his various ways pointed a mirror and we found out that someone like Johan Rupert, who is arguably the wealthiest South African, has also used Bell Pottinger for his many companies to do PR exercises. Things that we would have never known had Uzuma and the Guptas not been accused of using such tactics. Again, Bell Pottinger has never been able to confirm that Jacob Zuma hired them to use their services. All rumors and and implications and whatever the case may be. The Guptas pushed ESCOM for 1.68 billion rand prepayment. In this article, the Gupta leaks exposed the extent to which Matsela Koko, once tipped to become ESCOM chief executive, appeared to have been captured by the Guptas. Unfortunately, Matsela has not been or formally charged of anything and I would like to invite him because we, we did have him on the virtual Nkuku. We were meant to do an interview with him but there were issues with scheduling and we ended up not being able to do in that interview. I really wanted him to break down how, how in energy, uh, how electricity is generated in this country, why ESCOM has a monopoly, what are independent power producers, speak about a man I'm a huge fan of, Hendrik van der Beel, who actually built ESCOM along with Sassol, Isco, Sassol and other companies as well. And then obviously touching on his link to the Guptas, his relationship with Brian Mulief at ESCOM, any relationship with Jacob Zuma, speaking about the fact that at some point I think his stepdaughter was a beneficiary of tenders at ESCOM. And just speaking about all these accusations brought on by him and how he and Brian Mulief managed to stop load shedding back in those days when they were running it and why Andre De Reiter and other people are struggling and all these conspiracy theories that uh, the Minister of State-Owned Enterprises, Praveen Kordan, Cyril Ramaphosa and Andre Tareta are intentionally trying to sabotage ESCOM so that they can privatize it and sell it so that their friends and associates can own ESCOM in various pieces and charge people inflated prices for what we've now called a basic human right, the right to electricity. So the Guptas pushed ESCOM for 
eight billion prepayment, and it came out through Brian Mulifa that this was in the normal course of business because other companies get the same treatment. There's a term called vendor financing, which I hope we'll uncover at some point in some of my videos. It happened a lot in BEE transactions where big white companies would need a BEE partner so that they can earn BEE points so that they can do business with the government. And because they found a BEE partner, that BEE partner wouldn't have money, someone like a Cyril Ramaphosa. So through vendor financing, they would give this person shares almost for free, but through a loan. And then these shares would be paid back through dividends earned by this BEE partner, which is partly why a lot of these BEE deals were bad for the partners because there was no real value there. All your value was being extracted and given back to these big white companies through reverse payment through dividends. And later on, you see that the value of the deal itself was never as good as was promised initially. Tutuzane Zuma kept and captured. Tutuzane Zuma, the son of then President Jacob Zuma, emerged from the Gupta leaks, leaks as kept and captured by the Gupta family, serving as a key channel for influence on official decision making, including his father's. I want to speak about Tutuzane quickly because Tutuzane is one of the guys who claims he'd like to run for ANC president in 2024. He's got a lot of fans on the ground because apparently he's a good looking guy, speaks really good English, and a lot of people obviously love his dad. You know, Tutuzane Zuma, uh, along with his twin sister Tutuzile, used to sit on the board of the Gupta's companies. That's a fact. He's worked with the Gupta's, that's a fact. President Jacob Zuma has gone in parliament to explain that his son does work with the Gupta's and that yes, the, his son met the Gupta's through him. That's a fact. Obviously, nothing clear has been stated that Utu Tuzani went to his father to ask for favors. But we know how these things work. You have a link. If I was seen with Jacob Zuma, people will start feeling a certain way about me. And we don't know what happens in the background. A Jacob Zuma may not ask for favors from a company, but he may send someone close to him to go be there. We know that Jacob Zuma was responsible for certain appointments, Utu Tumieni at SAA, who uncovered that only 3% of the suppliers are black. He had a relationship with Ukhaudi Mutsuenen, who became the chief operating officer at the SAPC, where he pushed for 90% local. We know that he was involved in transforming treasury, which unfortunately now has been retransformed back and is no longer a fully black treasury. We know he was involved with the appointment of people like Brian Mulife at ESCOM, for example. So we know these things happen. And obviously he got to place finance ministers like um, Van Royen, who didn't stay there for long, for example. We know that he sacked Praveen Kordan at some point and then Praveen had to be brought back. We know he had those powers. So it can hold that some of the people in the background were doing a lot of favors for Tutuzane Zuma. Tutuzane has gone on to do an interview, I think while he was in Dubai, to explain his relationship with his dad. His father has tried because Julius Malima used to call Ubabaga Tutuzane in, in parliament and he made it like an EFF chant, Ubabaga Tutuzane. For me, it was a painful point because at that time I was thinking what Julius Malima had seen Jacob Zuma as a father figure to him. Both of them had been called uneducated or undereducated. They'd both from a young age raised, been risen or been raised by ANC seniors through the ranks of the ANC. He was vocal like President Jacob Zuma. He was a maverick and moved very um, astutely and, you know, in a very chess move like way politically and after all that he'd done standing on podiums and saying we're willing to kill or willing to die for Uzuma Uzuma when those opportunities came instead of taking his son his newly found son Julius Malima and putting him on the platform and making sure that Julius Malima benefits and when Julius Malima was being brought forth to ANC disciplinary committees U Jacob Zuma almost turned a blind eye and instead focused on giving all of those benefits and all of that love and all of that access to his biological son, Tutuzane Zuma, who had not been raised in the ANC, who had not gone on platforms to say we are willing to kill or die for Zuma, who was not supposedly under or uneducated like Jacob Zuma. And I felt like that was a moment for Julius Malima screaming his pain that I had seen you like a father and you had thrown me out and left me to be eaten by the wolves. And for that reason, I'm willing to do whatever it takes to make sure that you step down and you're attacked by everyone. That's how I felt. It's just my view on the story that that happened. Tutuzane spoke in Dubai about his relationship. He's spoken, I think, it may have been Newsroom Africa or ENCA, explaining that in particular because he was the son of Jacob Zuma. You know, everyone 
super analyze the work that they did, the licenses that they got. So where other processes and documents just went through, because he was Jacob Zuma's son, they got extra scrutiny. So they had, they had to make sure that they had to comply five times over. Jacob Zuma explained in parliament that I've got over 20 kids and it can't be that one of my kids, Dudu Zane, is good at business and he's proven that he's good at business and he must get attacked. All my other kids are not good at business. And yet this one boy, purely because he is related to me, cannot do business. And he said that is very, very unfair. Later on, Dudu Zane and his father would make videos, you can find them on YouTube, where they were having conversations, father to son, speaking to each other. And you realize that because his father was such a big figure and constantly working out there for the South African population, uh, for the South African government, for the ANC, etc. He was never really around to be a present father as we'd like to think. So there were a lot of questions Dudu Zane had for his dad. Dudu Zane and his sister, by the way, are half Mozambican because their mom was actually a Mozambican national who passed away, I believe, from suicide. You know, we're not really sure about that story. You know, there have been a lot of allegations with Jacob Zuma's wives, etc., etc. But I just wanted to mention that part, that Tutuzani and Tutuzila are actually half Mozambican because of their mom. But I wanted to raise that with Tutuzani and Jacob Zuma. Very young, charismatic guy, Tutuzani, struggles to speak. He's his Zulu, unfortunately, in the same vein that the new king of the Zulus, Misu Zulu, guys, uh, he can't read Isi Zulu, as we've seen. You know, it's very sad, I think, that they represent Zulu people and yet they cannot even speak the language of the people that they claim to represent. And who knows, they probably don't even follow the prescriptions of the Zulu culture. I know Tutu Zane, I believe, is married to a colored lady. Umisu Zulu had two children with a lady that he had not married. He quickly paid in Kaula and married her after being um, touted as the next Zulu king after his father and his mother had, had passed on. But those are stories for another day. Tutuzani Zuma kept, kept and captured. I can fully believe that the Guptas um, had captured Tutuzani, sat on their board, they were paying him, he did business with them. I can fully believe that in one way or another, Tutuzani probably in the back was pulling some strings from his father's connections, etc. I know Tutuzani at some point had helped with Titi Mabuza and he said this on platforms. He, when Titi Mabuza was sick, he helped uh, transport him to Russia where he got medical assistance. And Titi Mabuza has gone to Russia a few times. Maybe in future we'll find out exactly what those visits had to do with. Was Diti Mabuza really sick? Or are there certain deals that are happening in Russia that we're not aware of? I know for a fact that the nephew of Jacob Zuma, Kulubuse, fat boy, fat boy, Kulubuse Zuma, a big businessman in his own right, was touted to be one of the beneficiaries of the nuclear deal in Russia that all Jacob Zuma and them were trying to organize with all Vladimir Putin, where we are going to pay billions, hundreds of billions of rands for nuclear energy from Russia coming here so that we no longer need to rely on, on coal energy, so to speak. Apparently, we've still got a lot of coal in this country. And there's a lot of stories about what happens at ESCOM, our energy generation. Funny enough, now all of a sudden, Cyril Pravin and other people are now speaking about the idea of nuclear. When at the time, apparently, it was too expensive under Jacob Zuma. Now we're trying to speak about nuclear and how it's healthier and how it's better for the environment, etc. These are all things that we still have to learn and that we don't know. Like I said earlier, some of these stories bring up more questions than answers for a person like myself. Despite denials, Free State Dairy Farm was a huge cash spinner for Guptas. The Gupta lease unraveled four years worth of denials by the Gupta spin machine over the family's involvement in the controversial dairy project at Freda in the Free State. Dozens of emails, invoices and other documents showed the family had significant control over the scheme and sucked some 84 million rand to a company they controlled in the United Arab Emirates, the UAE. I can tell you now that there are a lot of political people, black, who are involved in a lot of our government funding agencies, who have benefited from the PIC, from the NEF, from CIFA, and other government institutions to get certain money for farms, for businesses, etc. And we don't really know where those deals have gone. That's why we don't know in the future if we'll ever fully get an unpacked report on what happened to black economic empowerment. Who fundamentally benefited? Where did they get the money from? Why did they get that money? What was their political connection? How did Cyril Ramaphosa raise money to build Shanduga? How did Patrice Mutsipa raise money to build African Rainbow Minerals? You know, who were they, rela who were they related to 
at that time? How did it work? Why did other people not get in? Who is Mzi Kuman? Who is Saki Matozong? Who is Dr. Enam Hukong, for example? And a whole host of other people. Lazarus Zim, Tony Yengin, uh, obviously the Mutipe family, or Bridget and all those people. So the Guptas, of course, have been beneficiaries of some of this funding, which is earmarked for black people, of which Indians fall under there. The Chinese, sadly, at some point were included in there as well. So they became beneficiaries of a lot of the stuff. And according to this story, they had this farm. Not much happened to in the farm. And a lot of the money that was funded to the farm was then rechanneled to other companies elsewhere. I think the farm at some point was running at a loss. Um, and I think it's now been handed over to certain people there. I'm not really sure of that story. The Dubai laundromat. How millions milked from free state government paid for Sun City wedding. The Gupta leaks reveal that the Free State Provincial Government largely picked up the tab for the event of the millennium, as it was described by a guest, KPMG Africa, then Chief Executive Moses Hosana. He was a guest, the KPMG African CEO. The 2013 Sun City nuptials of the Gupta's niece, Vega. The Gupta's niece had a very expensive wedding in Sun City, KPMG Africa's CEO was invited there. KPMG, of course, has been implicated in certain scandals around the Guptas and also around Steinhoff. I think, I don't know if it's KPMG or Deloitte, a lot of these audit firms. And yet with the Guptas, the Guptas' bank accounts were closed. A person like Iqbal Survey of Segunjaro Investments, who's benefited a lot from the PIC, his accounts were being closed. A Marcus Yester. People like Ivan Glossenberg of Glencoe, some of these other supposed white businesses have never had their bank accounts closed. And at some point, there needs to be investigations around who gets to pick. Who gets to pick which accounts get closed when it's all corruption? Why do KPMG and Deloitte and all these other auditing firms get to carry on operating when they've been involved in turning a blind eye to corruption, not doing full audit work? As we hear now, the Guptas had invited a CEO to a wedding of a niece. Who else was at that wedding? What are their links to business, to banking, to auditing, etc.? Where are those people today? How ESCOM was captured. In 2015, as Brian Mulifa and his key lieutenant, Anoj Singh, moved across to ESCOM, I think there used to be a transnet, the Guptas turned their attention to the power utilities' 40 billion rand primary energy budget. The feast was about to begin. I don't know if, I don't think this article goes into it. I don't like the fact that they're highlighting the 40 billion rand primary energy budget because that was ESCOM's total budget. We need to find out how much of that budget the Guptas were actually getting. And then of the rest of that budget, who are the beneficiaries? I've got a document that I received of a list of the biggest beneficiaries of ESCOM. Uh, I think over the last year or the last five years, I don't know where I'll publish it, but I think you can find it on the internet. I'd love to see a breakdown of the biggest beneficiaries of all government tenders, of which I'm sure companies like Bidvest sit at the top. Obviously, companies like Aspen sit at the top because Aspen currently not only supplies COVID vaccines, they also supply ARVs as well, antiretrovirals. Software giant SAP paid Gupta front 100 million rand kickbacks for state business. To clinch Transnet business, business software giant SAP SAP agreed to pay 10% sales commission to a company controlled by the Guptas. The evidence suggests the company, a little known outpost of the Gupta empire, was deliberately interposed to obscure Gupta involvement and to launder the proceeds to them. I'm not going to speak much about that, but I will speak about a term called substance over form, which I learned in commercial law at university level. Substance over form says it doesn't matter what you label this thing, it doesn't matter what it's titled under. We need to see what is the real substance of this thing. Cyril Ramaphosa has being placed as a chairman or a CEO of a Glencore listed company. He gets paid a salary or he gets paid directive fees. He gets paid commission for maybe bringing business. It's all above board. There's full disclosure. It's in the annual financial statements. It's there. It's legal. The auditing firms can tick. For example, this is just an example. It's not a real story. A Jacob Zuma for example, gets friends of his certain businesses at ESCOM and those friends pay him a bribe, of course, of lots of money. When you look at that money, it's equal to the money Cyril was getting in form of director fees, in form of commission, etc. 
The form of Cyril's thing is legal. It's above board. The form of Jacob Zuma getting bribes is illegal and it's wrong. This is just a hypothetical example I'm giving. The substance of those true hypothetical examples, the substance is that both of them are the same. You've got two politically connected people helping certain companies gain access to certain work and they are fundamentally getting money for that work. I only want to say this because SAP agreed to pay 10% sales commission to a company. That is, the form is legal, it's fine. This was commission, it's there, it's on paper. We pay commission, you bring work. But the substance may be a bribe. It may be a bribe, which is what is uh, alleged here, that it was 100 million rand in kickbacks, in bribes. The question for me and for some of you out there needs to be, all these other big companies out there, how much sales commission do they pay? A referral commission. And how much of that, forget the form and what it's written, how much of that is actually a bribe? That's why we look at people like oh, Tito Mboweni being an advisor to Goldman Sachs, sitting on the board of Discovery, sitting on the board of certain property companies. It's above board. It's legal, of course. But the substance of that is how much government business are these companies now going to get because the Tito sits on the board? How much red tape are they going to get around? How much leeway are they going to get that they wouldn't get if they had, didn't have a politically connected person sitting there? That's why we need to unpack all these BEE deals and saying, if you're putting a politically connected person on the board of a company, what exactly are you hoping to get from that person? It can't just be expertise because this person is just a politician. They're coming to sit on their board. They're not chartered accountants. They're not legal minds. They're not actuarial scientists. They're not salespeople. They don't know how to run operations and build business systems. So why exactly do you have that person there? Clearly, it's so that they can lubricate certain political deals and where you get blocked somewhere they speak to their mates and their mates make sure that things smoothly pass through on on paper it's all legal but the substance is that this is clearly the fees that they're getting are a bribe to make sure that they get certain political government work and they get the easing of red tape how the Gupta screwed Danelle the Gupta leaks showed that the Guptas tried to sell Danel's intellectual property to India while watering the state arms company's stake down to half. Acting as middlemen, they took the biggest stake for themselves and cut in a powerful Indian tycoon close to Prime Minister Narendra Modi for his influence. Danel is a weapons manufacturing company in this country and essentially we have almost lost Danel. South Africa is currently fragile because we actually don't know how to manufacture weapons anymore. A very interesting gentleman that I hope one day we will speak about is a guy called Ivor Ichikovits. Ivor Ichikovits. Ivor Ichikovits, I think, was a big ANC gent, comes from a politically connected family. He owns a company called Paramount. And Paramount is a big weapons manufacturing company in the world. Please go on the internet. Please look up Paramount. You will learn that there are people in this country you don't know about. Ivore Chukovic has got a good relationship with the billionaire Robert Kumete from Mpumalanga and Bombela. And at some point they owned the Lions rugby franchise in Johannesburg. Very interesting. But Danelle was our weapons manufacturing. I believe potentially it's currently been sold. I'm not sure if it was from the Gupta's deals themselves. That stripped Danelle of what it was. But for all intents and purposes, the last I checked, I stand to be corrected. I think certain companies in the Middle East have bought up Danel or parts of Danel. And even though it's a South African company, it is now owned by people that are foreigners. Manufacturing weapons for South Africa. This was a state-owned enterprise. Very tragic story. Did Gikaba and officials Greece Gupta Gears? The Gupta leaks revealed new evidence that immigration officials may have been captured by the Guptas, including two who were specially positioned in India by Manusi Kikaro's office when he was Home Affairs Minister. Emails showed how senior Gupta employee Ashu Chawa repeatedly asked these two and other officials to fast-track visas to benefit Gupta businesses as they moved dozens of employees, associates and family members between South Africa, India and Dubai. I can fully, fully believe this. These are allegations, of course. There's no fundamental evidence that Manusi Kikaro was captured and that he was doing all these things illegally, you know, jumping hurdles for the Gupta family, but I can fully believe this. And you need to believe this because I can tell you now, almost 
I'm not going to say all of us, a bulk of us in South Africa work on connections in various ways. You've got friends that work in certain companies and they make sure that your CV goes to the top of the pile. A lot of us, a lot of us have paid bribes to traffic cops. A lot of us have paid bribes to certain officials to speed up certain processes. A lot of the bribes we pay, unfortunately, are not because we want to pay bribes. It's because who sees in at that government department is like, hey, Pelangu has a cold drink. Hey, Tana, be cold. A cold drink in South Africa is 100 rand, 200 rand. Whereas the Litam Champe Coke is 15 rand. But all of a sudden, your cold drink is 200 rand. They're the ones saying, hey, Yazin Bonini Pepper, like, I got the I put the. Yazin Kabam, good mouthful, good shashians, a lento, a mong as in the cold drink, Yazi. You two wish you some pee, was not ten on Champe KFC. So a lot of us have paid bribes to get things fast tracked. Not just Malusi Kikaba and the Guptas, but a lot of politicians in various forms. And a lot of these articles are on the internet of various politicians sidestepping red tape, moving around, getting people to move certain things around for their benefit. That's kind of how it works. It's kind of what we do in our societies. You've got a sister that works at Home Affairs. You've got a cousin that works at a government hospital. You've got a mother who works at a government school. It's a, a lot of us use our connections to try and sidestep certain things so that we can get certain processes done. It's sad. It's a reminder that South Africa has become a very, very corrupt nation, not just at the upper levels, but all of us, even at the ground, we are involved in daily corruption. And of course, if you were home affairs minister and one of your family members needed help coming into the country, some of your illegal friends are here in the country and in the ITs, I can bet a lot of money that you would make sure that you get those things done. It's corrupt, it's legal, you should be punished, you should be fined, you potentially should be jailed. It's wrong, but it's what people do. It's what we call human nature. Not that human nature is right, but it's one of those things. So I can't believe these accusations of Umalusi Gikawa. Article written on the 1st of June, 2022 by a staff reporter, dailymaverick.co.za. I feel like stopping there because I've already gone through so much. I've already gone through so much, but I have to go. I have to keep going. Oh, Cyril Ramaphosa. I do not like Cyril Ramaphosa. I am not an ANC factionalist. I'm not an ANC factionalist. What does that mean? Let me go to the top of this article first. What that means is I don't care about radical economic transformation. The RET gang. Zuma. Who else was involved there? Uh, obviously, Omar Lucy Kikaba. Um, I think Ulindi or Sisulu might potentially be part of the RET faction. About Didi Mabuza, who jumped ship at the last minute. Ace Mahashule, Supra Mumapilo. It's there's like an RET gang. I guess that was Zandi Le Kumete in Durban, etc. Then there's the WMC, White Monopoly Capital Gang. Cyril Ramaphosa, Tito Moeni, Trevor Manuel, who has stated that he's no longer an ANC member. So convenient. Uh, Praveen Kordan, of course, the golden boy of the ANC, who is never, never held accountable. State-owned enterprises are falling sh to shit. He's not being blamed. He's not being fired. There's no uh, motion of no confidence. Um, and a couple of other people, of course, who work with whites, apparently, the white monopoly capital. I'm not an ANC factionist because I don't give a flying fuck whether RET or WMC. What I care about is our country functioning well making sure that our economy is growing, uh, not just for the wealthy elite, but for the country at large, so that we can create jobs for people, so that we have enough tax money, not for grants, I fucking hate grants, but so that we can build infrastructure, so that we can make sure they aren't potholes, you know, so that things are working. We want to have the post office back and not have to rely on PostNet, which is very expensive. You know, our government has completely destroyed stuff, and it seems Cyril Ramaphosa with his mates are trying to privatize as much of the state uh, assets as possible. We know Julius Malim of the EFF wanted to speak nationalization, which was one of the things that the Freedom Charter, which was an ANC directive. Now it seems like we're going from nationalization to privatization. And the sad thing is normal black South Africans seem to prefer private over public. If you've got a bit of money, you're not going to go to a government hospital. You're going to go to private healthcare and use your medical aid. If you're given an opportunity to send your kids to a private school, you're going to do that and not send them to a public school. You know what I mean? So we seem to not really believe in our government 
just in our normal lives. If you have the money, you get private security. You don't go and speak to the police. Which means we actually fundamentally don't believe in our government and our government itself does not believe in us. Because most, if not all, government employees send their kids to private schools or expensive public schools, which are almost like private schools. They have medical aid. They don't use government facilities. Even though they work there, or nurse, or whatever, they work in public hospitals and clinics, don't use those facilities. They use private health care, which should almost be a crime. A lot of your politicians who stand for black, Amanda, Abamnyama, your, your Julius Malimas even got EFF and those guys. A lot of these guys live in white suburbs that are run by the DA, the Democratic Alliance. They send their kids to white schools, so they fundamentally do not believe in their own people. It's, it's absolutely shocking and tragic. And there should be a law. There should be a law that forces government employees to use government facilities. There should be a law. It, it, it just does not make sense. I don't care about factions. I like Jacob Zuma as a gent. Lacka Pansul, I spoke about it. I don't like Cyril because he's cold. He's boring. I don't like the way he speaks. During the lockdown, he was dictating to us on the screen and he never took questions. Even from journalists, never mind from the public. He never took questions. Every time the South African public wants to say something to Cyril and the government, they seem to not listen to us and it's very, very upsetting. I don't like the fact that he's getting special treatment from the media versus a, a Jacob Zuma, for example. I don't like that his friends who are also, in a way, state capturers. They never get called state capturers. And yet the Guptas, clumsy Indian blokes, state capturers. And it may arguably be true. But what about these new state captures? Who funded Cyril Ramaphosa? Why can we not see his bank statements? Absolutely, absolutely ridiculous and very upsetting. Not just Cyril, but the judiciary, which seems to be captured. Our mainstream media, which seems to be captured. A lot of big business who seem to keep quiet when Cyril and Praveen and all these other politicians are up to shit. And even when Cyril and his, and his band of merry politicians are fucking the country up, who do they blame? Jacob Zuma, nine wasted years. Jacob Zuma, white, nine wasted years. Yeah, but Cyril was deputy president. No, it's Jacob Zuma. Yeah, but look at what Cyril... No, it's Jacob Zuma. No, but... No, it's Jacob Zuma. It's very lazy thinking. And for the zombie public, obviously they just fucking eat up whatever the media is saying and they believe whatever rubbish without really questioning independently. DailyMaverick.co.za, the title of the article is Mishandling of the Ramaphosa Farm Forex Theft Reflected in State Accountability Documents. I'm, I'm raising this because it's an important conversation to have and because some people are saying that this Gupta arrest is trying to distract us from what happened with Cyril Ramaphosa. I'm not going to read the whole article. I want to read it at the bottom where it speaks about what we what to know about the Ramaphosa farm forex theft. And the story of Ramaphosa, for me, has raised more questions than answers. A lot of questions. Former spy boss Arthur Fraser laid a criminal complaint against the president for holding and being robbed of almost 4 million US dollars in cash. Uramaposa confirmed the robbery at his Limpopo farm, I believe it's called Palapala. The Hawks have taken over the investigation of the multi-million dollar burglary. Ramaphosa volunteered to explain the allegations before the ANC's Integrity Commission. Stephen, 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 Khurutas explains why this is Ramaphosa's worst public image crisis since he returned to formal politics. Other questions remain. The South African Reserve Bank, the SARB, the SAB, is on public record saying it does not comment on any investigations. And the South African Revenue Services, SARS, is well known to maintain taxpayer confidentiality. So it's unclear whether Ramaphosa or his farming business is registered to handle foreign currency that so-called offshore buyers and hunters deal with. And it's unclear if the stolen US dollars had been stored in the sofa cushions for longer than the 30-day exchange window. If yes, penalties by the Saab could follow. When Ramaphosa paid Saab's Jews like value-added tax on the proceeds of the animal sales on his farm, whether, sorry, whether Ramaphosa paid Saab's Jews like value-added tax on the proceeds of the animal sales on his farm also remains unclear. It was a given that Fraser's criminal charges would offset an ANC factional political push to scupper Ramaphosa's second term presidential bid at the ANC December elective conference but it's also become enmeshed in statecraft and governance. 
due to the possible investigation, the presidency will not be in a position to engage on further details of the matters, the presidency statement said on Saturday. On Sunday, Ramaphosa, the ANC president, told the Limpopo ANC elective conference the stolen money was far less than reported. Reiterating his innocence on Fraser's claims in a faint invoking taxpayers' money, Ramaphosa said, I have never stolen money from taxpayers. My integrity as a leader will never allow me to do so. No one said Ramaphosa did. It's about Forex being in the cattle and game farming business, tax, and why the president doesn't seem to know about safes or seemingly how to use his own strong room. I'm a farmer. I'm in the cattle business. I'm in the game farming business, Ramaphosa told the ANC conference delegates on Sunday. And through that business that has been declared in parliament and all over, I buy and sell animals. This was a clear business transaction of selling animals. Except no declarations have been filed in parliament since 2018. That's when Ramaphosa resigned as he must, according to section 87 of the constitution, following his election as president in February 2018. Declaration as president would be kept. Declarations as president would be kept in the union buildings. Except no declarations have been filed since 2018. The available parliamentary declarations from 2014, when Ramaphosa became deputy president and put his wealth in blind trusts, show plenty of property owned, but not Palapala Pala Wildlife Estate, started in 2011. It may well be in the confidential section of the Member's Interest Register, although strictly speaking, only details like the address and size may be shielded. What is declared in the Chibase Trust that houses the Shanduga interests and 100 shares in each of Ndabanyoni feedlot and Ndabanyoni estates listed as cattle and game farms? Between 2014 and 2017, Ramaphosa's last parliamentary declaration, the value of the estate went from 50 million rand to 120 million rand, according to declarations. The February 2020 presidential farm forex theft has raised lots of questions and compromised statutory accountability documents such as annual reports central to parliamentarians' oversight. It is messy and to no small extent it's because of presidential fudginess. It's unlikely the criticism will go away. The opposition is set to seize the opportunities on Thursday when the two-day parliamentary session on the presidency budget vote kicks off. What Ramaphosa does in his Friday reply will be crucial for his presidency of both party and the state. That's from the Daily Maverick. Um, the article was written by uh, Marianne or Marianne Merton or Merton on the 7th of June, 2022. Oh boy. I wanted to speak, I wanted to read from this, this uh, Reserve Bank, resbank.co.za. You guys can look up these things on your own. It's just there's a lot of content on this stuff and I, I unfortunately cannot read through all of it or explain all of it because I, I do not know myself. Travelers may take cash and rent notes up to a value of 25,000 rand per person. That's the limit if you're traveling overseas. 25,000 rand. The SARS, a SARS customs declaration may be required for any goods taken outside South Africa. If the insured value of the item exceeds 200,000 rand prior written approval from the financial surveillance department through an authorized dealer is required. If the items exported will not be returned to South Africa and the insurance value exceeds 50,000 rand, an application must be submitted to the financial surveillance department through an authorized dealer. Adult residents above 18 years of age may use a travel allowance within the single discretionary annual allowance of 1 million rand per calendar year. That's travel allowance when you're traveling. 1 million rand is the limit. Residents under 18 have a travel allowance limit of 200,000 rand per calendar year. There's a whole lot of other prescriptions out under here because the question that was asked is how much money can a person keep on their person in their home? And there's arguments now between 25,000 rand and other amounts. How much are you meant to keep? And as I read in the Daily Maverick article, there's a 30 day limit of how long you can keep foreign exchange on your person before you have to hand it over and convert it in this country. Otherwise, con concerns around money laundering come up. 
Very interesting article from Mail and Guardian. Uh, written by staff report on the 13th of July 2012. Mr. Moneybags shrugs off the load. <laughs> Customs officials must get tired of rifling through people's luggage in search of illegal substances only to find dirty laundry. But the contents of South African billionaire Christo Visa's luggage proved to be far more interesting for the customs staff at London City Airport. When they searched the lug luggage in April 2009, they discovered banknotes worth £120,000 in his hand luggage and 550,920,920 ,920 pounds, sorry, in his bags checked into the hold. They must have thought that caught a major mover in the Costa Nostra. Instead, that confiscated what was really small change for South Africa's third richest man at the time. But it has taken three and a half years and many dinner table discussions about why anyone honest would want to cut around so much money in his luggage for Visa to win his case on appeal at the High Court in London and have his cash returned, he got his money back. I was confident that I would win because I had done nothing wrong and was carrying the cash according to the rules, Visa said, but I was always aware of the often unsaid insinuations. Although he said it's over now, the lingering doubt over his integrity and the time spent on ridding his reputation of money laundering accusations had to, be ta had take had to have taken their toll on him, but not on his business deals, he said. The accusations were always out there, but I got the sense that it never impacted on my ability to conclude transactions or deal with the banks. During that period, I did some substantial transactions. Oh boy. Visa expla Visa's explanation was that he had decided to invest the proceeds earned from diamond deals done in Belgium that had been sitting in a strong box at the London branch of Swiss Bank UBS for about 20 years I'd never gotten around to investing it before. It had never exercised my mind. I had decided to deploy the funds and earn some returns on it and was taking it to my bank in Luxembourg. If I'd gone through the normal channels and opened a bank account in the UK, I would have had to make various declarations on transactions that were done many years ago. It was the easiest route and completely legal. I'm going to leave that article there and for you guys to have your own questions. Substance over form. Some people get special treatment and some don't. Last I checked with Tutuzani Zuma can't open a bank account in South Africa. Last I checked. EWN.co.za Eyewitness News. The headline EFF Namibia calls on Gengov, Gengov to disclose interactions with Ramaphosa. The article was written by Kosi Kona Duma and Baba Ndenze about 15 hours ago. It's understood that the suspects who colluded with President Cyril Ramaphosa's domestic worker in February 2020 were Namibian and fled to that country after stealing foreign currency amounting to millions of rands. The economic freedom fighters in Namibia has called on President Haig Gengob to fully disclose, disclose all interactions with South Africa's President Cyril Ramaphosa after the arrest of suspects who broke into Ramaphosa's Palapala farm in Limpopo. It's understood that the suspects who colluded with Ramaphosa's domestic worker in February 2020 were Namibian and fled to that country after stealing foreign currency amounting to millions of rands. The Namibian, a newspaper based in Vinduk, reported on Sunday that Ramaphosa called on Gengobt for assistance in locating the alleged criminals. It is reported that suspects who broke into Ramaphosa's farm were paid 150,000 rand each for their silence on the incident after being caught. The Namibian EFF has alleged that Ramaphosa and Gengob share a corrupt relationship and colluded to conceal details about that robbery. The party has called on Namibian law enforcement agencies to publicize what they know about what they claim to be Ramaphosa's money laundering, theft and bribery. The party said it would use its parliamentary participation to establish the extent of Gengob's involvement in the alleged concealment of the crime. It said it would open a case against Gengob if sufficient evidence emerged. However, Ramaphosa has denied any wrongdoing. Meanwhile, United Democratic Movement UDM leader Bantu Olomisa said he wanted Parliament to investigate that robbery and what has been alleged to be a cover-up. Olomisa has written to National Assembly Speaker Nosibio Mapisa Ngawula to suggest a preliminary investigation headed by two or three retired judges whose findings will be handed over to the NBA. He said Parliament had a responsibility to exercise oversight over the executive. 
The UDM leader in his letter said President Ramaphosa should take a sabbatical while the matter was investigated. Both the UDM and the Democratic Alliance have raised concerns about whether the president was part of the cover-up. Olomisa said the investigation should also find out if Sardis was aware of the foreign currency at the farm. Other allegations include the torture of suspects and the failure to report the robbery. Olomisa said the allegations have been, had been greatly destructive to the country's image. To the country's image, not to Silver Ramaphosa's image, to the country's image. Some of the questions I have, I'm ending this video now because I'm tired and I've been speaking for a long time. Sol Ramaphosa, of course, didn't disclose some of his business interests. How many other business interests has he not disclosed? Sol Ramaphosa apparently says he didn't inform his neighbors of the crime because he didn't want them to panic. Why would you not tell your neighbors of crime? Because they have an interest. There might be crime in the area. And if you say it's because you didn't want them to panic, how many other crimes, Cyril, have you not reported because you don't want people to panic? These auctions where money was made, allegedly 4 million US dollars, which might be 60 million rand. Why are the people at the auctions carrying cash? Why are they not uh, transferring via EFT? Where is that money coming from? Why so much cash? And again, why was that cash sitting in sofa cushions? Or supposedly mattresses, as some people have reported. Why was it not in a safe, in a strong room, in a stronghold? Why has that money not been banked? How much other money is Cyril concealing on some of his, on some of his other properties? Again, we have to ask about the bank statements. How much money has Cyril or his friends, family or associates given to certain political people and for what reason? Andil Ramaphosa was mentioned under Bosasa with the State Capture Commission as having gotten money from Bosasa which gets tenders from government. At the time Cyril said he knew nothing about it, later on said oh he did know something about it but he was not involved even though his son was involved. Tutuzani Zuma was dragged for being linked to his father in the Guptas. Cyril Ramaphosa's son Andile Ramaphosa is working with a company which has done work with the state and yet there's no cause of state capture. There are so many things we don't know about Cyril and I've said before that I think Cyril might go down as the most corrupt president that we have. Glencore has been fined 1.5 billion US dollars. South Africa has not been mentioned. What has Cyril had to say about that and his relationship with Glencore? How much money has been moved? Were there any bribes? Who is going to investigate that? Because it seems like our judiciary, our police services, etc. are captured. How many other shady dealings are there out there that we need to find out about? SARS, the Saab, are they going to be clean and transparent about what's happening? And then obviously we have to go back to the beginning. What's going to happen with the Guptas? Are they going to be extradited? Are they going to come back into the country? And if they come back into the country, under, under what charges? Is there even proof? Or are they still going to have to start again and investigate? We're seeing now the Senzo Meiwa trial, which has been dragging for years. Even though there were witnesses in the house. <laughs> we heard now, I think it may be from Advocate D for that. Why are there five suspects? Meanwhile, the witnesses say there were only two people that came into the house. Are we ever going to get justice in this country? We have a legal system which favors the rich that have money, that can pay millions and millions of rands for court cases to drag over and over. Jacob Zuma has, of course, used some of these legal loopholes to push over cases. Now, all of a sudden, he's sick. Now, he's not well. And he's pushed that forward because there's the money. And when he doesn't have money, people fundraise on his behalf. The people at the top seem to just not care about the masses of this country and seem to not care about this country. They would rather focus on becoming rich and wealthy on their own with their friends and their associates. I haven't even spoken about the fact that uh, Bridget Mutsipe, who is married to Jeff Khadebe, has been implicated at some point and accused of having an affair with an ex-president of, I think it may be Botswana. Apparently there have been deals, dodgy dealings between them as well. I think Ian Kama, Ian Kham is the name. These stories never make big headlines and splashes. What are the relationships like there? So many, so many questions that I have. I hope we'll get some of the answers. But even if we don't, for me, it's just enough to be able to question almost everyone at the top. And it's a reminder to me personally to focus on my people, focus on myself, 
focus on my family, focus on my children, focus on my friends, and focus on people that believe in me. Partly why I've built my own religion, my own culture, I'm trying to find my own people so that we can find pieces of land where we can put things like free Wi-Fi, have our own energy creation, whether it's solar or alternative, or even if we're buying energy from ESCOM, it's fine. Grow our own food so we're not reliant on the same funders of the politicians to buy groceries from them. Have our own education systems that focus on practical skills and create our own spaces and travel the whole world because thinking about politics gets me very, very depressed and very angry. Very, very angry. I hope you guys will have a great day. Thank you for sitting through this, those of you that did. Um, please share this video. Please post your comments and your questions so that I also have certain information and comments and questions that I can work on in my research. And let's engage and educate each other, especially in insulating and isolating ourselves away from politicians who are corrupt, along with their funders, who are also clearly corrupt, who we buy from. We buy from these businesses. These people that are constantly funding your politicians to be corrupt, we buy from those businesses, unfortunately. So we are just as complicit in the bullshit that we find ourselves in in this country. And at some point, it needs to stop. We need to constantly follow the money and we need to find ways to begin bleeding the beast. If there are ways for us to not pay tax so our politicians aren't eating money with their business associates and tender premiers, we need to find intelligent ways to do that. I love you guys very much. Pay you all the black pen. Have a great day. Cheers.